years ago, my, one of my daughters was working with the United Farm Workers for a couple of years out in California, and she described to me a project that was gen then underway at the, uh, at, I think at Davis, California, the university, where uh, they were trying to create uh, cubicle tomatoes because they'd be easier to store. Uh, you can imagine what they would taste like, <laughs> but uh, that's pretty much what goes on. So like, to say, take tomatoes. I mean, I actually did read an interesting book about, I forgot the name of the author, about the production of tomatoes in the United States. and. Uh, it's industrialized. I mean, they're apparently, they produce the kinds of tomatoes that will last on the supermarket shelf and that look red, or maybe they even color them, I don't know, but they look like tomatoes, but they taste like sawdust. And uh, I, I imagine they have no nutritional value. But that makes sense from the point of view of commercialized agriculture. After all, you're in it to make money, not to feed people. And it uh, drives... Uh, productive agriculture out, it, it drives farmers out, I mean, it has a horrible effect elsewhere in the world. I mean, you know, we talk about an, supposedly an immigration problem in the United States. I mean, a lot of the so-called problem is due to the fact that the trade agreement with Mexico uh, was designed to destroy Mexican agriculture. Uh, Mexican campesinos are perfectly efficient, but they can't possibly compete with uh, highly subsidized uh, U.S. agribusiness. There is a movement for better use of the uh, farms and ranches and forests. Uh, it's a very encouraging movement. It has, it's a competent movement and it has a lot to show. Uh, it is not at this point a massive movement. We wrote up the 50-year farm bill, spent quite a bit of time thinking that through. And um, uh, in a way, we knew when we took it to Washington, Fred Kirschman, Wendell Berry, and I took it to Washington, we knew the likelihood of it getting adopted was pretty close to zero. But what it has done is increase the imagination uh, about possibilities uh, in a lot of different places. Now, what we can hope for is that that begins to get some grip uh, on a large and the development of a constituency. Agriculture is the largest product of humanity, and currently uh, it occupies area of one third of land mass of the earth, which is larger than the area of Asia. Agriculture, in my view, uh, is the first environmental uh, problem, the oldest. And it started with the need to tear up the ground in order to have a seed bed for an annual. And there's where the idea that nature is to be subdued or ignored. Oh, are, are we're going to be in a period, and probably a long period, of food insecurity because we've, we've, it was always a good bet for 10,000 years, you know, that if your grandfather grew corn in a field, your his granddaughter would be able to do the same. And that's just a sucker's bet now. I mean, uh, you know, um, it's gotten, it's getting routinely too hot to grow crops in a lot of places. And when it isn't, or too dry, we also see these big increase in very extreme downpour and deluge. And that's no good for farming either. So, you know, it's, it's gonna be a magic act to try and keep enough food on the table for a population as large as ours. One of the, one of the most uh, uh, serious of the manifestations of food shortages is something we're now seeing in a number of countries, which is foodless days, um, something like 20, 24% of the people in Nigeria now routinely plan foodless days. Families cannot afford to eat every day. The same is true in Ethiopia, in uh, India, uh, Peru. Um, so we've, we, we're now seeing evidence 
further evidence of how food supplies are tightening. And at some point, this begins to translate into political instability. Let's say we feed 7 billion, and then we feed 9 billion, and then we feed 12 billion. And all the time we are doing that, we are compromising the soils. Uh, we are contributing to more greenhouse gases. We better start asking the question, so we feed them, then what? Then what? What about what doubling are we going to quit uh, paying attention to? So what we're doing in the interest of the here and now is compromising the long-term potential. There's a notion in economics of externalities, you know, things you don't pay attention to when you're carrying out a transaction, and that's what you're describing. So yes, let's nice to feed more people, but what else are we doing? What? Well, you know what they were doing. They're poisoning the environment, destroying the soil, making it harder to produce, uh, uh, creating uh, pests for which you have to create new pesticides and an ongoing struggle against nature to try to maintain the thing. So it's a very mixed story. What could actually, what's the, what, could, what could the value of resources be ultimately, even from a human perspective, if it gets really, really tight? Go to Haiti now and see what, how much are people needing to give up in order to get food, you know, so, so desperate people. After 40 years of uh, work on this topic, I've concluded that it is outside the capacity of this culture to deal with these issues. So solutions are going to be imposed on us. So I'm all in favor of echo uh, technology. Mushrooms and trees are terrific and solar energy is great. Uh, but if you somehow imagine you could plug it into the current global political system, and it's going to solve problems, and of course that's just a fantasy. Our agriculture cannot exist for thousands of years, by definition. And so, so we do have a problem. You know, we probably went already through half of soil in Midwest or so, topsoil. So, and that's 150 years. And if you want to look how agriculture looks like you know, 4,000 years down the road in countries that didn't do it quite well, look at the Middle East. Middle East essentially is a history of failed agriculture. That's what it is. And all these conflicts and, and terrible displacement that you have there is in fact related to uh, soil that went dead and, and, uh, and inability to feed people. One of the keys to a more sustainable approach to agriculture is a less capital intensive one where farmers aren't so worried about paying these enormous bills. Those tractors that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the, the incredible price of land which comes up because farmers are competing with each other. Right? Why is that land so expensive? Well, it's, it's, it's expensive in part because farmers are producing at such a close margin. When you've got a high volume, low margin situation, the only solution is for you to produce more. In a, in a certain sense, there's nothing that fails like success. You tend not to learn <laughs> from it. You know, you, uh, you know, we're getting 160 or 70 bushel acre corn. Uh, we got these big soybean crops. I mean, we know what we're doing, we say, because uh, we live with this illusion of the speed at which it's going. Water shortages are becoming uh, more acute, and, and we see them almost everywhere now that we have agriculture. Um, so we have climate, we have water. We have population growth continuing to um, continuing to be a problem. We're still adding 80 million people a year. That means there'll be 219,000 people at the dinner table tonight who weren't there last night. Tonight there'll be another 219,000, and that that's sort of relentless. We keep keep it keeps pressing and keeps putting more and more pressure on the Earth's resources. Agriculture is a huge user of water. In fact, it's the second largest user of water after power generation, um, electrical uh, power stations.
but power stations most, mostly cycle water through, make it warmer, and you can actually reuse that water. While with agriculture, you know, it gets uh, incorporated into the plants and evaporated, so you need to deliver water. And then, of course, the water that you deliver, if it has salts, the salts accumulate in soil, so you have to flush the soil, and then you have the problem of too much salt building in parts of your system, which is what you see when you drive down the Central Valley in California, where big swaths are completely dead, used for storage of salts from the soil. In fact, toxic salts, because there's all kinds of metallic stuff that is being washed with this water, you know, cadmium, mercury, all kinds of other things. We're already in a process of drastic change and discontinuity. So it's not as if we could look out 40 or 50 years and see that we need to do something by then. I've said often, and it continues to be borne out just uh, by the front pages of the papers, we, and by we I mean humanity, most especially the industrialized uh, part of it, are in a period now where over the next 20 years, we will see more drastic changes than we saw in the last 100 changes in the political system, in the living standards, uh, in the uh, quality of the environment, and so forth. There's no global problem, really. There's a global storm. And the question is, how ready is your boat? And with boat, I don't mean, I mean, it could be a nation, it could be your investment, it could be your city, because cities don't move. So it seems so obvious, and that's kind of missed in the in the public policy debate, and that goes in back to agriculture that we think, oh, we can. I mean, like the economic the economist extreme statement, Nordhaus made this statement some years ago, twenty years ago, I think, when he said, oh, agriculture is just two percent of the GDP. Uh, we grow for a year, and that's like we we got these two percent back. <laughs> and then more physically oriented economists say, yeah, but if you take out two percent of your body, like your heart. You cannot grow it back that easily. My son-in-law, who's in Mexico, <clears throat> just wrote me a couple of days ago about an area in northern Mexico, which is just being, where the, and he sent me a newspaper article about where the uh, trees, everything's just being cut down and destroyed. And what, where there are trees that are being sold for firewood uh, was an apple orchard. But it's, again, impossible to compete with highly subsidized U.S. agribusiness. And in Haiti, it was scandalous. I mean, the, uh, when Clinton sent the Marines in, finally, to restore the president, he did it with a condition that they set up uh, uh, harsh neoliberal rules which bar any kind of tariffs. Uh, and uh, Arkansas rice farmers, uh, again, heavily subsidized, you know, big business, uh, can produce rice at, at a cost that will undercut very productive um, Haitian farmers. Effect, net effect, uh, Haiti became uh, dependent on foreign rice, and the uh, rice farming disappeared. Actually, same thing happened with chickens. Uh, one of Haiti's very few successful small industries was producing chicken parts. Uh, but Americans apparently don't like dark meat. So the big producers like Tyson uh, have a extra dark meat on their hands. And uh, they'd like to sell it, dump it, basically. So they tried dumping it in Mexico and Canada, but those are governments that function. So they blocked it by anti-dumping procedures. But thanks to Clinton, Haiti couldn't do it. Uh, so Tyson managed to wipe out, uh, Tyson and others, to wipe out Haitian uh, uh, chicken part manufacturing. This kind of thing goes on all over the place. And it's, uh, it's destructive of health, it's destructive of independent farmers. Uh, there is an international movement via Campesina, which is trying hard to uh, resist it. I've actually been at international conferences of theirs, which are, this one was in Brazil, which, uh, which brings together, it was quite exciting actually, brought together uh, peasants from all over the world, you know, mostly pretty poor people, but uh, uh, they were, there were stalls where uh, women were showing off seeds that they'd cultivated and telling others about them, a lot of interchange, a lot of 
excitement, enthusiasm. And that represents a counter tendency of which what people like you are doing is a part. So there is a tendency towards a commercialization and uh, uh, aiming at money, not not a successful, not not anything useful, nothing useful for people, maybe harmful, but money. And there's an alternative tendency towards trying to, you know, something that's called localism, towards trying to grow food locally, uh, cut back on the exorbitant uh, transportation costs, and improve the health and the success. And of course, that's. You know, it's kind of an unequal battle. On the one hand, you have highly concentrated capital supporting by state, supported by state power, as in the examples I mentioned. On the other hand, you have uh, people trying to do things on their own. Uh, that's, a, that's not just agriculture. That's over the whole society. I mean, the whole society is being driven by, and especially the last generation or so, by a, an ideology of... Uh, uh, actually, there was a name for it back in the mid-19th century. In the early days of the Industrial Revolution, right around here in Massachusetts, uh, uh, working people who were forced into the uh, factories, uh, women, young women from the farms, factory girls they were called, uh, you know, Irish artisan from Boston and so on, they had a very lively labor press that they wrote themselves, and they bitterly condemned the industrial system, which was degrading them, who was taking away their freedom, their creativity, their individuality, their culture. And one thing that they condemned was what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth, forgetting all but self. For 150 years, a huge propaganda system has been trying to drive that into people's heads. Uh, you're happy if you can consume more. Uh, forget about everyone else and make sure you're okay. And it's uh, created... Uh, a kind of a sociopathic society. The agriculture industry produces large quantities of greenhouse gas emissions. Because the agriculture industry, the corporate agriculture industry, is essentially an extension of the fossil fuel industry. You know, synthetic fertilizer, fuel for traction, and then the energy to move the resulting commodity food thousands of miles around the world, these, are, these add up. Um, that's why it's very good news uh, that we're starting to see the reaction, you know, that local food is the fastest growing part of our food economy, that, uh, uh, that last year, for the first time in 150 years, the USDA said that there were more farms in America, not fewer. That's a very good sign. Now, whether we can keep it going, uh, it's, it's, it's hard because Every time Congress passes a farm bill, they help the biggest corporate growers and hinder the smallest community farmers. But people's desire for real food and good food at the moment is kind of trumping that, and that's magnificent to see. After having gotten to farming myself 20 years ago now, I've realized that guess what, it is, it is about agribusiness in that the smaller family farms, if we want to survive, we have to band together and uh, collaborate with one another. We can use whatever model and form we want, whether it's LLCs, LLPs, C corporations, cooperatives, whatever works for the people involved, but we have to stick together and continue to you know, raise our livestock in a humane manner uh, to grow our crops without herbicides and pesticides if we so choose because if we don't hang together, surely we'll hang separately. Slow food, well, I think as long as we have a lot of highly dense energy, we're gonna have fast food. Uh, slow, slow money, as long as we have highly dense energy, we're gonna have fast money. Uh, but that doesn't mean that slow food and slow money uh, are irrelevant. It simply means that they are kind of placeholders uh, the examples that are going to be around uh, that serve as the, um, uh, the, po the places of potential to expand as our consciousness gets better and the perceived need becomes greater. When, when, when you think about agriculture, we have to think about an enterprise that changes the entire planet and it has emissions uh, pollution potential, which is larger than 
uh, any other human activity, and, and I hate to add you, including fossil fuels. And, and that sounds counterintuitive, but you have to understand that agriculture started about 8,000 years ago, uh, essentially from burning forest and, and you know, massive deforestation, which has been occurring ever since. And even if your emissions per year of, let's say, CO2 are small, but you continue doing this for 8,000 years, your cumulative emissions are huge. Just look at the front page of any newspaper, and when you start reading about climate change and droughts and uh, uh, food uh, import requirements for many people and so forth and so on, it's, it's clear that we're an overshoot. Overshoot in the simplest way is if we take from if for any species but if we take from that ecosystem a given ecosystem more than what it can regenerate within a given time let's say over a year's period so we can cut trees more quickly than they regenerate we can pump water more quickly out of the aquifers that they regenerate that then recharges we can fish more rapidly etc i don't do this work because I'm an optimist, and I don't really even think I'm an optimist particularly. I think anybody who does this stuff alternates between, all, between optimism and pessimism hundreds of times on a daily basis. And I kind of think it's almost like that fluctuating between the two is like alternating current, and that's kind of the energy that drives me forward. Really, I think if you were just an optimist all the time, it would be fairly ridiculous really. You know, Bill, Paul Hawken has that thing where he says, if you're, if you're not, if you're a pessimist, if if you're an optimist, uh, if, if 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 you if you read the climate science, and you're and you're not a pessimist, you haven't read it properly. Go back and read it again. And if you've and if you've been, come into contact with the movement of people around the world who are trying to do something about it, and you're an optimist, you don't have a heart. Which I kind of go along with that. You know, th there is no guarantee that this is going to work. I, c I don't know if it's going to work. Who can, you know, there's no, this work doesn't come with any promises or guarantees or anything. And, you know, if you spend time reading, you know, the stuff about what's happening with the oceans and the acidification of the oceans and stuff, it's just absolutely, absolutely ghastly. Um, but at the same time, you know, as I say, I meet, I meet movements and people and organisations who, who, who've given up. And I don't see that this is the time to give up. This is absolutely not a time to give up. Yes, the organic content of our soils has dropped a lot. People around the world are discovering, and it's very good news that the agronomists bring us, that crop yields are at their highest on small farms, often with very low inputs of things. Uh, you know, we replaced a lot of human labor and human skill and judgment with fossil fuel over the last 50 years and bringing back some of that skill and judgment and some of that muscle work too um, uh, will result in higher yields on smaller farms and that's good news for everybody except Cargill and ADM. Uh, the, what, what's going on with, with toxins on this planet is just uh, mind-blowing to me that, that we would who ever thought this was a good idea? Let's put poison on our food. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> An evil genius couldn't have come up with a better plan. For us, even soil is just dirt. We poison it with pesticides and herbicides. We plant um, these uh, genetically modified plants that exude toxins and in fact kill bacteria around them and around their roots. They prevent them from, uh, let's say, soybeans from sequestering nitrogen, which was which soybeans do so well otherwise. And so we're doing things with, which are in exactly opposite direction to what we should be doing. Genetic engineering, gene splicing, as it's currently done, the knowledge of what uh, genes and what, which traits are critical for increases in productivity, I think that research is very important. Well, then when it comes to finding new genetic variants, variations, uh, saving oodles of seed is where it's at. You cannot find a more cost-effective uh, way of finding new genetic variations than by letting pollination take place. 
What is interesting is of all the different promises that the biotech gene splicing world has come up with, the only things that they've done are simple one or two gene splices that only confer like a resistance to an herbicide. What they have not done yet is um, uh, a non, um, uh, come up with a series of traits that produce a non um, trade out that don't have negative consequences. They haven't come up with a massive breakthrough that increases productivity. The, the yield potential of corn and soybeans has not gone up since biotech. You just have different tools at your, at your disposal now, different chemicals that you can use. From my perspective, it's new dependencies that now you become dependent on your, on your supplier for your new inputs. But it has not produced any uh, increase in the yield potential of crops. The big issue with GMO seeds is that they haven't been developed with an eye towards solving problems. They've been developed with an eye for making more money. And the two are not the same at all. I think that also means that some of the ways that GMO development has been done has been using techniques which rush something to the market before we've been able to check and study if it was going to be ecologically appropriate, if it was going to be okay for people's health. So again, it's that money basis uh, behind it. We're genetically selecting for the plants that can handle the world as it actually is. The Macintosh apple was first discovered, I think it was 1839. It has not changed in 175 years. Well, the world has. And we haven't changed our varieties fast enough. We need to produce new varieties, plant a zillion seeds, select the ones that reproduce real quick. The first ones that set seed, we want those. The ones that are pest-free, disease-free, and can subsist and persist and thrive on whatever soils we have. Uh, somewhat of a heresy is the fact that I claim that there's no such thing as a soil deficiency, mineral deficiency, anywhere on this planet. People are like, what? Of course there is. You know, the whole uh, you know, fertilizer industry is based on that. Plants will live everywhere on planet Earth. Uh, there are plant, plants that will live on solid rock. Plants will live with every single mineral deficiency known, known to mankind, but only the plants that are adapted and selected for those conditions. So everywhere around the globe, we can select for those plants simply by putting those seeds in the ground and using the selection criteria that I just mentioned before. Well, one of my big fantasies is the inaugural address of a president that would go something like this. My fellow Americans, from this day forward, we as a people will measure our progress by how independent of the extractive economy we become. We're not going to stop anything all at once, but we're going to start a tendency. And tomorrow morning, my first executive order will be to put a cap on the mines, the wellheads, and the port of entry, and on deforestation. And next year we'll lower that cap some more. And then we'll see how good our technology can be. My fellow Americans, our technology potential has not been really tested because it has all come during the expansion in the consumption of fossil fuels. Now, a lot of people can imagine <laughs> Uh, them given that inaugural address. But why is it that the politician cannot? If, if the people who currently manage the economy won't create the economy that we want to see, we need to create it ourselves. And we need to get on with it now. And that's what we're seeing in transition all over the place. Whether it's transition or not, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. Really doesn't matter what it's called, but you know, people starting to put in place new food systems, new energy systems. It seems to me like actually we're on the verge of being able to bring in uh, investment to drive that. We bring in the right support to enable that. We bring in some kind of profile and, 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 and stuff for that. I don't see any reason why we can't scale this up really, really quickly.